everybody. Uh, welcome back to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. I'm MC Owens, and this is the Vig Malakirti Experience, part eight, the final part, in which we discuss chapter 12. Um, thanks for being here. Thanks for coming. Um, uh, don't worry, I I'm not going to recap anything. <laughs> This is part. This is part eight. If you if you're just tuning in now, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> We're, um, you know, I don't have to tell you about all the wonderful things that have happened. You know, I, I don't need to tell you. You know, um, and because it's such a special chapter, this last oh, this last chapter, it's so special. Uh, I don't really want to waste any time. I do want to just get into it. Um, as usual, I have a lot to say. I, I do want to just read uh, the uh, read parts of it, but it's also um, well. We're gonna we're gonna take another Tathagata shot, Tathagata shot, um, which is how I started off the class last week, uh, which was sort of a primer. Right, it was just this uh, way of getting our minds sort of back in this mode that that we're in when we're discussing this sutra, when we're discoursing about this dharma. Like your mind kind of gets in kind of a frame of mind. You know, you start thinking a certain way, start thinking about certain things, and so in order to put us back in that frame of mind, we're gonna get another uh, tathagata shot. But this time, it's from Vimalakirti himself, right? And so in many ways, what I did last week was a, a funny prelude or a foreshadowing of what was to come, um, which uh, is, the, uh, you know, I had to introduce this complex idea of Tathagata. Um, you know, it's one of those things where I mentioned last week that in the world of Buddhism, this word Tathagata that that was a title or a way of describing the Buddha, especially it was a way that the Buddha used to describe or speak of himself or itself in that way. So Tathagata is a very old term. And as I've been saying night after night after night, you know, this, this Vimalakirti Sutra is sort of, you know, it's next level Mahayana. It's not even Mahayana, it's next level. Mahayana. And what I mean by that, of course, is that like the non-duality, like the idea of vimoksha or liberation, these are not your average vimoksha or liberation. This is not, you know, your average Mahayana Sutra. And so the idea here is, is that the audience, the, the typical audience of this sutra would be well versed in this idea of Tathagata. You know, it would be second nature to a Buddha Dharma practitioner, a Buddhist from the days of, of old, right? It would be second nature for them to think of the Buddha in terms of the thus come one or thusly gone one, right? These ideas. And so last week, I just tried to get us up to the, the normal speed of Tathagata which is this idea that the, that the root of that word tathagata is tathata, and tathata is this really profound Buddhist idea of suchness as it, as it isness. I like to, to translate it just as it is. Um, it's a very, very interesting idea. And, it, and last week I spent a lot of time emphasizing that the only way to really touch or encounter this presence, this tathata, is in the present, in the present moment, in the present body. And if, if I didn't emphasize it last week, then I'm going to emphasize it this week, which is the point of that idea of emphasizing the presence of it is that the tathagata in that sense, the, the Buddha, but the tathagata, cannot be conceived of as being in the past <laughs> as like a historical figure 2500 years ago oh so long ago oh so far away in time and space from us tathagata is present 
that again, it's the only way for it to happen. And so it gets very interesting, borderline mystical when these sutras keep speaking about the Tathagata and in particular, these different Tathagatas. And that is also a, a newfangled idea. It's also a, a next level Mahayana idea, which is that your old school type of Buddhism, the, the Tathagata was Siddhartha, Gotama, the Shakyamuni, the Buddha. That's the Tathagata, period. Like, and you know, maybe we can talk about a Buddha that appeared thousands and thousands and thousands of kalpas ago, and that was the Tathagata. But no, 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 the Tathagata was the Buddha, is the Buddha, pardon, right? That's the idea of this, this uh, old school idea. There's only one Tathagata. But in this sutra, Tathagatas are popping out of the woodwork, right? They're coming out of everywhere. So that's going to be a little tricky in terms of presence, right? Or conceiving of that presence. So I just wanted to remind you of that idea that the Tathagata is a way of thinking of Buddha or the Buddha or enlightenment. And again, this sutra starts off with that. And I think, I think I'm just going to dive in. I'm going to deal with the title of this chapter in a minute. I, you know, I just want to do it that way. I just want to dive in. Um, I do need to remind us, though, of something that happened last chapter. And that was in the, on the chapter on the destructible and the indestructible. And an interesting thing happened, which was, um, you know, Vimalakirti, our star of the show, our hero here, he basically said, hey, uh, Manju Shri. Uh, this is on page 84 of the Thurman translation. If you want to read along, he's like, hey, Manju Shri, um, let's take all these living beings into the presence of the world honored one so that they may see the Tathagata and bow down to him. So that's where Vimalakirti was like, hey, everybody, you want to go see the Tathagata? Yeah, let's go see the Tathagata. And so he managed to, again, miraculously, you know, you know Vimalakirti, he managed to put everybody and teleport them into the presence of the Buddha. It's important to note that idea from that cha last chapter where Vimalakirti says, hey, let's go see the Tathagata. Now, of course, if, if if you heard everything I just said about Tathagata as being like presence and thusness and all of that idea, then to see the Tathagata is like, whoa, what's that? Well, indeed, that's how chapter 12, our last chapter, how it starts. Thereupon, the Buddha said to the Lichavi Vimalakirti, ha, psych. So, here, <laughs> I, I just realized, I, I, I typed up a whole version of this because I have something to say. This is, I've been sharing with everybody that I've been reading through these various Chinese translations. I've got all the English translations. I'm doing the best I can with the Sanskrit, you know, because I'm not a Sanskritist. But in going through all of these chapters, I have to tell you that um, among all the English versions, even among each, all the uh, Chinese ones, this has got to be the trickiest, uh, not chapter, but just this first part that I'm gonna read, the first part of this uh, chapter. It's notoriously uh, uh, diff difficult to translate. Um, and I want to share with you a little bit about why that is, because it's really relevant to this idea of the Tathagata. So, you know, from the very first session of these uh, classes, um, Michael Taft and I, we've been trying our best to, you know, uh, gender neutralize the text, right? Trying our best to either be sensitive with our pronouns. I'm, I'm the type of person that just likes to avoid them all together and speak in the plural. So bodhisattvas do this, bodhisattvas do that. 
Unfortunately, of course, the text is, is as it's translated by Thurman and actually everybody, it's real heavy on the only, only guys get to play. So only he does this, he does that, you know. And, you know, if you've been studying the Dharma or even just paying attention to this sutra, you know that at a certain point, such dualistic distinctions as male, female, all of that are absolutely, totally absurd. I mean, like, like, <laughs> anyways, the reason why I mention that is that you know, I, I'm a, I study Chinese. I'm not really a Sanskritist. And I love Chinese. It's a really beautiful language. And one of its um, really beautiful qualities is the lack of pronouns, articles, and the ability to speak it naturally in a gender neutral way meaning that the grammar allows for gender neutrality, mainly because it doesn't have articles and, and pronouns and things like that, that it allows for it, it just to be. So what I mean by that is, is that it's very unfortunate, I have to say, that in all of these translations, the, the, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, the Tibetan and the Sanskrit, and I can tell you, for certain, the Chinese, in speaking of the Tathagata, in speaking of this idea of Buddha, enlightened naturedness, these the Chinese, they go to such lengths, <laughs> even, even within the realm of Chinese where it's already a little gender neutral, they go to such lengths to devoid this chapter of pronouns and articles like he, you, the, how, you know, this is going to be about how, do you, how can you see the Tathagata? And unfortunately, the translation of Thurman as we have it is, well, you can see him, you can see him, this, you can see him, and it just goes on and on. And what's sad, in my opinion, is that these people, they have put back in the male pronoun of he, when all of these people tried to take it out because they actually understood that this Tathagata thing at this point, at this level, it's so far beyond. Uh, and we're, not even, we're, we're really, really arguably not even talking about a person or people at, at all. <laughs> so I just want you to know that I, I started marking up this uh, the Thurman one so much that I had to abandon it entirely. <laughs> and then I had to go back and do my own fresh version that is sort of in a way, it's the format again, like I've been doing of the Sanskrit, the Thurman version, but with the, in, with the Chinese as my guide, because they did such a good job of stripping all this, uh, the, the gender out of it. Okay, so what I'm about to read is sort of my own like take on it, but it's only really, you'll see where it is. You'll see where it's really slight if you're reading along. So I had to digress on that to let you know about this, that again, you know, while the, th while the Tathagata in old school Buddhism may have still been a male idea of Buddha, we're way past that now, right? And just on that note too, you know, I'm going to try to, I'm going to do my best to, to flow this, you know, cause it's a, it's pretty technical, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm just hoping that this language helps and doesn't hurt is what I'm saying. So now thereupon the Buddha said to the Lichav Vimalakirti, when you wish to see the Tathagata, how do you view? Or, hey, when you just said, let's go see the Tathagata, how do you view the Tathagata? That's, that's the question. In both the Sanskrit and the Chinese, there's actually some really interesting language going on here where it's about seeing. Uh, in Chinese, it's a jian versus 
perceiving. Guan, it's this play between perceiving, but it's like a really deep idea of, 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 of understanding and versus seeing with the eyes. And so there's exchange going on that when you want to see the Tathagata, the Buddha asks, how do you view, how do you perceive the Tathagata? Thus addressed, the Lichavi Vimalakirti said to the Buddha, I view the Tathagata by not seeing any such thing. <laughs> How's that? I see the Tathagata as not having been born from the past, not passing on to the future, and not even abiding in present time. How is this? The Tathagata is the very essence, which is the reality of sensation, Vedana, but is not sensation. Tathagata is the essence, which is the reality of perception, Samya, but is not perception. Tathagata is the essence, which is the reality of conditioning, Samskara, but is not conditioned. It is the essence which is the reality of consciousness, vijnana, but is not consciousness. Like the element space, the Tathagata does not abide in any of the four great elements. Transcending the scope of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind, the Tathagata is not produced in any of the six sense media. The Tathagata is not involved in the realm of desire, the realm of form, or the formless realm, is free of all defilements, has passed through the three gates of liberation, and thereby endowed with the three super knowledges, having truly attained the unattainable. The Tathagata has reached the extreme of detachment in regard to all things, yet is not a limit of reality. The Tathagata abides in the ultimate reality, yet there is no relationship between them. The Tathagata is not produced from causes, nor does it depend on conditions. It is not without any characteristic, nor has any characteristic. It has no single nature, nor any diversity in natures. It is not a conception, not a mental construction, nor is it not a construction. It is neither the other shore, nor is it this shore, nor in between them. It's neither here, nor there, nor anywhere else. Neither this, nor that. It cannot be discovered by consciousness, nor is it inherent in consciousness. It is neither the darkness nor the light, neither a name nor a sign, neither weak nor strong, neither living in a country or in any direction. It is neither good nor evil, neither compounded nor uncompounded. It cannot be explained as having any meaning whatsoever. The Tathagata is neither generosity, dana nor greed, is neither disciplined nor undisciplined, neither tolerant nor hate-filled, neither driven nor lazy, neither concentrated nor distracted, neither wise nor foolish. It is inexpressible, being neither true nor false, neither escaping from the world nor failing to escape from the world neither a cause of involvement in the world nor not a cause for involvement in the world. It is the cessation of all theory and all practice. It is neither a field of merit nor not a field of merit, neither worthy of offerings nor unworthy of offerings. It's not an object and it cannot be contacted. It's not a whole nor an accumulation. It surpasses all calculation. 
it's utterly unequaled yet equal to the ultimate reality of all things. A Tathagata is matchless, especially in determination, surpassing all measure, not going, not staying, and not passing beyond, neither seen, heard, distinguished, or even known, without any complexity, having attained the equanimity of all knowledge, equal toward all things, the Tathagata does not discriminate between anything. The Tathagata is without reproach, excess, or corruption, without conception, without intellectualization. It's without activity, without birth, without occurrence, without origin, without production, and without non-production. It is without fear and without regret, without sorrow, without joy, and without strain. No verbal teaching can express it. Such is the body of the Tathagata, and thus should it be seen. Who sees thus truly sees. Who sees otherwise sees falsely. Okay, so that's our intro. Boop. That's that. Questions about Tathagata, because we really shouldn't move any forward, any further forward if there's questions about Tathagata. A quick question. I found I was, I was sort of like, just given the context of the sutra, kind of anticipating the punchline of like, and also it's all of those things that I just said it wasn't. Mm. And, um, and I'm wondering like, is the idea to just kind of, like that felt like just any concept you would try to put on it. It's just like, no, 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 no. Like stay out of concept. Um, but then I got stuck. I guess I was expecting there to also be like this sort of superseding thing where it also is all those things. Mm, yeah. Two, two things I would, yeah. Yeah, this is a tricky one, of course. Two things. One thing is, is that I hope there's an echo of the Dharma door of non-duality chapter, right? Where this is neither, 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 neither. And it's this like constant backing off. And I think that's the mode is a kind of, and so that's why you don't ever get this sort of positive movement that you're suggesting, Katie. The important thing about a, all, a lot of the language that got dropped, in particular, the language of produce, dependent upon conditions, not being a part of the sixth sense media. You know, so much of what we've been talking about and so much of this Dharma is about this idea that to, you know, not just to break up the world in terms of like, subject object this and that and here and there but there's apparently an inherent folly in dividing sense media into six kinds of sense media meaning that if i think i'm seeing it and eh, you missed it if i think i'm hearing it eh. so the tathagata is definitely not a discriminated object of this world that can be seen because that's what discriminated objects are, stuff that's seen. <laughs> and it's not a discriminated object that can be heard, smell, taste, touch. And then this last one, <laughs> even conceived of by the brain that you think is between your ears and behind your eyes. Yeah, that brain's never going to get anywhere near the Tathagata, right? But there's this, you know, slightly transcendent, you know, we have access to the Buddha mind, trans a slightly transcendent mind not slightly but mega by doing this like letting go action and so one of the things that's really interesting it's only in it's only in one of the chinese translations so i refrained from including it but the most famous of the chinese translations when the buddha says to vimalakirti hey how do you how do you view the the tathagata the vimalakirti's very first thing he says is that I view it exactly as I view the true nature of my own body. 
And that's exactly right. Because if you do understand the real, true, empty nature of your own body in that way, understand it as all of that, you know, the, in terms of the lesson of emptiness, see chapter five, but that idea then, the reason why that line is very powerful and the reason why it's actually probably not in most of the translations is because it's so powerful. <laughs> As much as this sutra in this chapter is really trying to not make the Buddha an object of worship or an object of reverence and in no way trying to make it separate from you in that way, uh, that can be a very pr uh, powerful idea that I think a lot of other translators have been like, let's maybe not go there. <laughs> But Kumara Jiva, he starts with this great line. I see it exactly like I see the true nature of my own body, which then means that if, if I am getting this, Tathagata, it, it, how could there be two? And, you know, so there's that interesting thing going on about like, you're the Buddha, Buddha nature and all of that, right? And so... You know, Katie, that's a, it's a great question, not question, but observation, the way that that went down. But I actually think it's because, no, I know why. Now that I've given it some thought, it's because we can talk about the title of the chapter now. So uh, Robert Thurman has this uh, really descriptive uh, ch chapter 12, Vision of the Universe Abhirati and the Tathagata Akshobhya. Um, all three Chinese versions, again, that I've been using, they're consistent in what the title of the chapter is, and it is seeing, and interesting that the Chinese uses the jian, the, like the eye, seeing Akshobhya Buddha. That's actually the name of it. So... That's the name of it. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to spoil it. I'm not going to talk about Akshobhya just yet. But it, the idea of it, and you got it from this first question or this first thing that I just read. It's this idea of how do you see the Tathagata? Like that's the, that's the question, right? And this first thing is like, well, you definitely don't see him with your eyes, your ears, your nose, your tongue. In fact, he's completely unproduced. Da, 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 da. And it's this complete negation. Negation, 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 negation. And had the chapter just ended there, I'd be with you, Katie. I'd be, I'd be with you in terms of like, wait, 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 don't just leave me with the, the, the Tathagata is not. But then this isn't the end of the chapter. So I think the answer that you would like in that way is coming full circle with the, the whole chapter. Yeah. So any other questions, comments, ideas? Tathagata. Cool. Um, so on that, I'm jumping back to the, the printed text. And we're back to Shariputra, right? <laughs> and the Venerable Shariputra then asked the Buddha, world honored one, in which Buddha field or Buddha land, Buddha Kshetra, did this Vimalakirti die before being reincarnated in this Buddha land, in this Buddha field? The Buddha said, Shariputra, why don't you ask this good man, uh, good, good man directly yourself where he died and why? And, where he died to be reincarnated here. Then the Venerable Shariputra asked the Lichavi Vimalakirti, Noble one, where did you die to reincarnate here? Vimalakirti declared, Is there anything among the things you see, Venerable, that dies or is reborn? Shariputra replied, there is nothing that dies or is reborn. Likewise, Venerable Shariputra, as all things neither die nor are reborn, why do you ask, where did you die to, re to reincarnate here from? 
Venerable Shariputra, if one were to ask a man or a woman created by a magician where they had died to be reincarnated here from, what do you think he or she would answer? Shariputra replied, a magical creation does not die, nor is it reborn. The Malakirti replied, Venerable Shariputra, did not the Tathagata declare that all things have the nature of a magical creation? Shariputra replied, yes, that is indeed so. The Malakirti replied, Shariputra, since all things have the nature of a magical creation, why do you ask, where have you died to be reincarnated here from? Venerable Shariputra, death is just the end of the performance and rebirth is the continuation of the performance. But although bodhisattvas die, they do not put an end to the performance of the roots of virtue. And although they are reborn, they do not adhere to the continuation of sin in the world. Okay, let me pause there. This, of course, you know, um, a big, a big teaching, a big lesson that gets re, re, uh, comes up in every chapter is this kind of, um, well, it's a realization of the birthlessness of all things. And then that's coupled with a, a patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all things. But it is this, an, a theme, it's a message of the sutra, which is about the birthlessness of all things. And pretty, you know, every night I've sort of tried to touch upon this in a different way. I don't want to get too bogged down in the, in the philosophy of emptiness tonight, because again, this is chapter eight. The idea is this, this shouldn't be like, wait, what, what's this about things not being born? It should, it should be, you should be Shari Putra being like, but yeah, that's what we've learned now, eight weeks later, the birthlessness of all things. And so, you know, in many ways, Shari Putra's question is a dumb one <laughs> in that way. But, you know, he's asking it because, you know, he wants to move the story along, of course. All right. So I don't want to uh, spend too long in that idea. Um, I do uh, just want to make one note about this beautiful line. And, you know, you can interpret it or translate it actually a number of different ways. But this idea that just death is the end of the performance and that reincarnation is the continuation of the performance. I want to remind you of the overarching plot of this sutra, which is that Vimalakirti is sick, right? And everybody has gone to like console him in that way. And when I started this class series, I you know was piggybacking off this idea of the Anathapindika Sutra, also a, a wise lay elder in the Buddhist community, also sick also dying, the Buddha, Shariputra, everybody goes to see uh, the uh, see Anathapindika. And of course, what's sad about that sutra is that Anathapindika dies at the end. You know, that's as, you know, that's the idea, right? And, and he, go, he goes up to heaven, goes up to one of the higher heavens and becomes a bodhisattva and it's all really wonderful, right? But I want you to kind of keep that in mind that that's that's what this sutra is about, right? Is that Vimalakirti was sick. And so we all went over to console him and he flipped it on us and tell us, don't worry, right? <laughs> and gave us this amazing lesson on the deathless, on the birthless. And then, the, and then I guess what I just want to kind of drive home is that if this sutra is a deathbed message, it's a consoling kind of it's a hospice tale in that way right and so what is the message of the hospice tale that death is just the end of the performance and reincarnation is the beginning of a new performance right so there's there's something very important going on here in that way right not just heady philosophy about emptiness in that way so i just wanted to make that point Let's get to let's get to the fun. 
let's get to the miracles. Yeah. So then the Buddha said to the Venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, this holy person, Vimalakirti, came here from the presence of the Tathagata Akshobhya in the world system, in the universe called Abhirati. So Shariputra knows about Abhirati. You might not know about Abhirati, right? You might not know about Akshobhya. So before I can read any further, we need to know a little bit about this Tathagata. So I've drawn here Abhirati. It's important to note that this is a, a whole world system. Um, and I didn't maybe emphasize this, but, you know, when all of those big giant thrones came shooting over from Maru Pratiparaja, that Buddha land with Maru, uh, with, uh, or Maru uh, Devaja and all of that from the thrones, that was a world system. It wasn't like just a heavenly realm. It was a whole, like with continents and oceans and people and all of that. And, you know, this Abhirati is a whole other world, like ours, very much like ours. And it's kind of famous. This, sutra, this world has its own sutra. This Buddha, Akshobhya is his name, the blue-bodied Buddha. Akshobhya means immovable. So this is the immovable Buddha or the immovable Tathagata. Okay. His name is Akshobhya. The land is Abhirati. Um, Abhirati is like a wild word, a wild idea, but it's like, um, well, it's usually transited as like extreme joy, extreme delight. Um, Abhi, A-B-H-I, of course, is this really interesting word, which I just learned today so Abhi, like Abhi Dharma, Abhi Nyana, Abhi Nya, that's a word that we came, or we came across. The, the English prefix ambi, like ambidextrous or ambient or just ambi, it comes from Abhi. Interesting. And so this kind of like ambi joy, amb, uh, like just joy everywhere, pervading everywhere. Um, Rati, Rati is not uh, Sukha. There is another, another land, another Tathagata world. That's Sukha Vati Vyuha. That's the land of bliss. This is the land of pleasure. Okay, so that's this Akshobhya, the immovable Buddha. His land is the land of pleasure. Uh, ambi pleasure. And Shariputra says, world honored one, it's wonderful that this holy person, Vimalakirti, having left a Buddha land as pure and wonderful as Abhirati, should enjoy a Buddha land as full of defects as the Saha world that we live in. The Lichavi Vimalakirti said, Shariputra, what do you think? Does the light of the sun accompany the darkness? Shariputra replied, Certainly not, noble sir. The Malakirti, Then the two do not go together? Shariputra replied, Noble one, those two do not go together. As soon as the sun rises, all darkness is destroyed. The Malakirti said, then why does the sun rise over the world? Shariputra, it rises to illuminate the world and to eliminate the darkness. The Malakirti said, just in the same way, Venerable Shariputra, a bodhisattva reincarnates voluntarily in an impure Buddha land in order to purify the living beings there, in order to make the light of wisdom shine and in order to clear away the darkness. Since they do not associate with the passions, they dispel the darkness of the passions of all living beings. 
I'm just going to let that one kind of linger and sink in there. The sun and darkness, light and darkness thing, just you could, you could think about that for a while. But thereupon, the entire Zoom multitude experienced this desire to behold the universe Abhirati and the Tathagata Akshobhya, his bodhisattvas and all of his great disciples. The Buddha, knowing the thoughts of the entire multitude, said to the Lichaviva Malakirti, Noble one, this multitude wishes to behold the universe Abhirati and the Tathagata Akshobhya. Show them! Then the Lichaviva Malakirti thought, Without rising from my couch, I shall pick up in my right hand the universe Abhirati and all that it contains, its hundreds of thousands of bodhisattvas, its heavenly abodes of devas, nagas, yakshas, gandharavas, and asuras, bounded by its chakravada mountains, its rivers, lakes, fountains, streams, oceans, and other bodies of water, its Mount Sumeru and other hills and mountain ranges, its moon, its sun and its stars, its devas, nagas, yakshas, gandharavas, and asuras themselves, its Brahma god and, its, and his retinue, its villages, cities, towns, provinces, kingdoms, men, women, and houses, its bodhisattvas, its disciples, the tree of enlightenment of the Tathagata Akshobhya and the Tathagata Akshobhya himself, seated in the middle of an assembly as vast as an ocean, teaching the Dharma. And the wonderful lotuses that accomplished the Buddha work among the living beings there. And the three jeweled ladders that rise from its earth to the levels of the 33 heavens, on which ladders the gods of that heavens descend to, to the world to see, honor, and serve the Tathagata Akshobhya and to hear the Dharma from him, and on which the people of the earth climb up to the 33 levels of heaven to visit those gods. Like a potter with his wheel, I will reduce that universe Abhirati with its store of innumerable virtues from its watery base all the way up to the highest heaven, I will reduce them to a minute size and carrying it gently like a garland of flowers will bring it to this Saha universe and will show it to the multitudes. Then the Lichavi Vimalakirti entered into a concentration and performed a miraculous feat such that he reduced the universe Abhirati to a minute size and took it with him in his right hand and brought it into this Saha universe. And in that universe Abhirati, the disciples, the bodhisattvas, and those among the gods and men who possessed the super knowledge of the divine eye, they all cried out, we're all honored one. We're being carried away. Sugata, Sugata, we're being carried off. Protect us, O Tathagata. <laughs> but, the dis <laughs> but to discipline them, the Tathagata Akshobhya said to them, you're being carried off by the Bodhisattva Vimalakirti. It's not my affair. <laughs> As for the other man and gods, in the world Abhirati, they had no awareness at all that they were be being carried anywhere. And although that universe Abhirati had been brought into the universe Saha, and the Saha universe was not increased or diminished in any way, it was neither compressed nor obstructed, nor was the universe Abhirati reduced internally and both universes appeared to be the same as they had ever been. Thereupon, the Buddha Shakyamuni asked the multitudes, Friends, behold the splendors of the universe Abhirati, the Tathagata Akshobhya, the array of his Buddha land, and the splendors of these disciples and bodhisattvas. They replied, we see them, world-honored one, 
The Buddha said, those bodhisattvas who wish to embrace such a Buddha land should train themselves in all the practices of the bodhisattvas of the Tathagata Akshobhya. While the Malakirti, with his miraculous power, showed them thus the universe Abhirati and the Tathagata Akshobhya, 140,000 living beings among, the me, among men and gods of the Saha universe conceived the spirit of supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment, and all of them formed a wish to be reborn in that universe, Abhirati. And the Buddha prophesied that in the future all would be reborn in the universe, Abhirati. And the Lichavi Vimalakirti, having thus developed all the living beings who, who could thereby be developed, returned the universe Abhirati exactly to its former place. The Lord then said to the Venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, did you see that universe Abhirati and the Tathagata Akshobhya? Shariputra replied, I saw it, world honored one. May all living beings come to live in a Buddha land as splendid as that. May all living beings come to have miraculous powers, just like those of the noble Licha Vivimalakirti. We have gained great benefit from having seen this holy man such as this. We have gained a great benefit from having heard such a teaching of the Dharma. Hence, there is no need to mention the great benefit for those who, having heard it, having believed it, relied on it, embrace it, remembering it and reading it, penetrating it to its depth, and having found faith in it, who teach it, recite it, and show it to others and apply themselves to the yoga of meditation upon its teaching. Those living beings who understand correctly this teaching of the Dharma will obtain the treasury of the jewels of the Dharma, those who study correctly this teaching of the Dharma will become the companions of the Tathagata. Those who honor and serve the adepts of this doctrine will be the true protectors of the Dharma. And those who write, teach, and worship this teaching of the Dharma will be visited by the Tathagata in their homes. Those who take pleasure in this teaching of the Dharma will embrace all merits. And those who teach it to others whether it, be to, whether it be no more than a single stanza of just four lines, or even a single summary phrase from this teaching of the Dharma, they will be performing a great Dharma offering. And those who, de who devote to this teaching of their Dharma, their tolerance, their zeal, their intelligence, their discernment, their vision, and their aspirations, thereby become subject to the prophecy of future Buddhahood. The end. Friends. Comments, questions. So the Tathagata yeah. is like an essence of everything and nothing. I, I mean, I think that is certainly a, a good place to start. <laughs> I think that is certainly a good place to start. I think what's really tricky about this, and, and this isn't, this is not a, this is not a, you know, this is not a trick. This is not a, a way of dodging the question or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I'm trying, I'm going to try to be real sincerious about this, right? The idea is like to, to, to say, oh, then Tathagata is like the essence of all things or not is to, to, um, to identify, to, to, conceive of and so it's this really wild thing where it's like oh you want to think about the tathagata you want to see the tathagata oh well uh <laughs> start doing the dhyana start letting go start deconceptual like because it's yeah. the only way it's going to happen 
So it's actually a very interesting kind of weird process where that if you're actually going to touch and conceive of, conceive of the Tathagata, you cannot be operating or using the mind like you might normally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and thus the upaya, thus the antics. <laughs> yeah. So it's more of a felt. Like, yeah. like it's hard to put into words what it is. But I think I get it. I think you do too. Any other comments? Well, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, it, it, see, it seems to me that so much of what we, we've been doing is um, not this and not not this, right? And this sort of you uh, tuned out. I got the uh, not this, not that. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so so much of this has been about you know it not this and not not this and this this continual exercise of of uh, you know approaching what is inconceivable right <laughs> expressing mm -hmm. apprehending experiencing the words don't get at it but yep where it's like this not going in with quotes, going out of, <laughs> of quotes. Sort of. Yep, yep. But for both Tania's question and Giancarlo's comment, or both comments, I should say, the, the really important part about a lot of this, pr from a practical practice point of view, but also from an actual really deep psychological, philosophical, dharmic point of view. So... It's this idea, yes, we were doing a lot of the not, and then not, 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 and all of that. But there's a very important part of all of this, of that not, of that not, notting, right? That it's like, oh, look, look at all the differentiated people. Right, look at all the little Zoom windows and all the differentiated people that I'm differentiating on the screen, that I'm differentiating from myself, that I'm differentiating from all of that, right? Uh, discrimination, delusion, I'm not getting the emptiness, I'm not getting the dependent originated reality here, right? Everybody following me on that? Like, well, so then the temptation would be, oh, so then not the Tathagata, not the Tathagata, this is not the Tathagata. This is not the Tathagata. Well, then I'll see you later. I'm going to go try to find the Tathagata because it's not this. Bye. Right? And the idea is, is that there's a for, very important part of all of this. Which it, it says that it's also not not this. You are all, you're not not the Tathagata. I am not not the Tathagata. And so it, it, allow, it, it doesn't allow for escapism in any form or not even, you know, escapism is sort of like, oh, I'm going to drift away to the, to the Diana heavens and have a better time. Bye. It's like, it's about, you'll never find the Tathagata up there. You'll never find the Tathagata down there, over there. And yeah, you'll never find the Tathagata like here either, but you won't not find the Tathagata here either. And that's, I, that's the delicate nature of all of this, but it's about the, that we don't abandon this. This is it. This is the place of practice. This is Buddha town, <laughs> right? This is Buddha town. <laughs> so it's not just negation, but it does want you to re, really can rethink what is in front of you in that way. Um, yeah. Hi, Michael. Connie, Connie's here. Hi. Hey, um, hey am I wrong? Um, I, in, in my understanding, um, Tathagata is um, 
um, Buddha, Buddha nature is, is the nature of mind. Is when Buddha texts talk about the clear mind, right? Is this correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, it's a, a little tricky because, you know, Buddha nature, what's called a Tathagata Garbha, actually. So there's Tathagata, the thusness or thus, um, this language of thus come or thus gone, that's like Tathagata. I mentioned this last time, this idea of Tathata is the suchness, that you know, that which is before you, but is, that is not ignorance, that which is before you, right? That, that tathata, aga, the aga, tathagata, it actually means to arise out of tathata. So it is so the- is it, is it more like a quality then? Well, what's really wild about it though, is that tathata is this idea of suchness. As, again, as it is this, just things like kind of as they are, warning, warning. But the idea is that tathata is this sort of blanket, this warm blanket of dependently originated reality, right? That's tathata. Tathagata is very much kind of a being, like a person, you know? So it's a weird thing where it, it is about you, it is about me, it's about sentient beings, it is about Buddha nature. But the idea is that a Tathagata is a being. You know, I would, I would, definitely, not, I would definitely not wanna say a living being in that sense. And then of course, even being is in real giant scare quotes there in that regard, right? But the Tathag, so there's Tathata, the warm blanket of dependently originated reality. There's the Tathagata, the, the, the one that emerges out of the warm blanket of dependently originated reality. Mm -hmm. And then that underlying nature of all of that, that's that Buddha nature, they say Tathagata Garba, and Garba means a womb. Mm -hmm. But you know, you, I, I I hear you. For me, like what what is coming up for me? Then, as you explained to me, I see there is um, the I, I sense a duality, and in my understanding, that tathagata is out of what you just said, right? Like the the call, it's out of it. So basically, you divide it, you separate it somehow conceptually, but it's obviously this it has this, they, they have the same qualities yes um okay and what i actually the more the point that i was trying or started to make earlier was about uh the buddha nature or tathagata garba it, there's a whole genre a whole world of sutras that really get into that idea and this actually doesn't so much mm -hmm. this one's sort of not going that far with it so i'm i i i think you're thinking along the right lines um it is just interesting that that language and that idea has didn't pop up in this sutra that much okay. so got it thank you mm -hmm. anything else i have i do have there is an epilogue there is um a little more to this and there's definitely a more that i have to say about vimalakirti but because it's our last class I definitely want to make sure to address any lingering ideas or issues. Eric, I see hey, you. Well, yeah, I think thinking all week about the Tathagata precisely, and mainly after your class, but also uh, an episode of a friend of mine where he was talking about enlightened beings. And it was his position, and it's also a very same position that you cannot see the Buddha or an enlightened being. If you see the Buddha in the street, kill him, right? And I have found uh, that view in my way of seeing things very disempowering because it is negating you from the experience of enlightenment. Because as you've been saying, and the Buddha himself has said that, yes, you probably cannot or won't see the Tathagata by its characteristics, but once you are able to see without 
appearances than you will see that at Agatha. And I think that's super empowering because you will see it in you. It's something that you will perceive it. It's not out of our reach in that sense. And yeah, I think I've been also so lucky to be introduced and empowered into tantric lineages where that concept of empowerment is nothing but giving you that confidence to see yourself as also an experiencer of that enlightenment, making you not too different from Shakyamuni. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks, Eric. Michael? Yeah. It's no one. I know. Hi, I'm sorry, I'm in the dark. Um, I have two questions. One I think is super easy and one I think is impossible. <laughs> okay. Um, the first question is uh, uh, it's a minor point. You said when you were talking about gendered language and how uh, I think you said that I know Chinese is not gendered in the way that most European languages are. And I think you were saying that neither is Tibetan nor Sanskrit. But then you said something that about how those the original languages, there's an effort to not gender the Tathagata. Is that is that what you were saying, or is it just the nature of the language that that, that the mention of the yeah. Tathagata is not gendered? Is it an effort that the yeah. writers uh, made, or is it a, just the nature of the language? On that note, yeah, no, uh, Sanskrit is gendered and all of that. I didn't mean to indicate that. It's not like Chinese that way. But I did mean to say and get across that the Sanskrit version and the authors of the Sanskrit version of this chapter seem to have gone to lengths at dropping the gender because they are seem seemingly smart Buddhists and they know that it's a little weird to start talking about the Tathagata as he when we, we've, we, again, we abandoned gender with bodhisattvas. Like that was a while ago that we're done with kind of gender. So Buddha's Tathagatas. Yeah. yeah. So. So Chinese, you'd have to go to an effort to gender it. Sanskrit, you, you have to go to an effort to not gender it. And they did. As far as I understand. But in, Eng but in the English, the translations we have, they didn't make that effort or they didn't follow the, the exactly. lead of the Sanskrit and keep it non gender. Thank you. In, for in fact, it kind of looks like they went to a certain length to, pa to patriarchify it. How, how surprising. Yeah, right? Wow. <laughs> but, Thank you for clarifying. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, my harder question is yeah. one of the things that uh, Michael Taft emphasized last week, and you have made very clear is that bodhisattvas are not concerned with their own enlightenment so much as they are the enlightenment of all beings or of all beings and non-beings <laughs> and um so i have a, a practical question there was a piece in in the today's sutra where you talked about um the solace of of the end of this life not being the end of life. Yep. And I wonder how we can convey that solace to those who don't, who aren't already, mm. not that I'm a Bodhisattva, but that's my uh, sort of uh, intention, you know, and not that I have a firm understanding or belief in an afterlife, but I do find solace in the teachings in the Dharma. And I'm in a situation where I'm trying to convey solace to someone who may be near the end of this life and may not understand anything about this. And so my very practical and difficult question is how to be a Bodhisattva in this situation and convey these teachings without resorting to, you know, things that this person doesn't believe in or have any conception of. Hmm. Thank you for any light you can shed on that. Yeah, that's a very, very serious question. Um, you know, and it raises a lot of very interesting ideas about, 
you know, it even came up at the end of this chapter, right, about this uh, developing a wish to be reborn in Abirati, right? And indeed, you know, this, this Vimali Kirti Sutra is very, um, as you might have noticed, it's pretty wild. Um, but it, it's wild for a number of reasons. Um, one of the reasons is, is it runs the gambit of Buddhist sutra genres. What I mean by that is, is it's, it's considered like one of the heaviest hitting philosophical sutras out there, especially about the, like the Dharma doors of non-duality. So on the one hand, it's like considered one of the like highest pranya paramita sutras. So the, this whole genre of sutras that deal with pranya, this transcendent wisdom, there's whole sutras that deal exclusively with that idea and they go into like, you know, Aristotelian, you know, levels of logic to try to really hash this stuff out. And despite those volumes of Pranyaparamita sutras, this is still considered one of the best Pranyaparamita sutras. But then they, they snuck a Pure Land Sutra in on us. Like we thought we were doing philosophy and all of a sudden we got teleported to the pure land and we're like doing devotion to Akshobhya. How did, whoa, right? We didn't see that coming. So I did want to, and, and trust me, Noam, I'm, I'm going to try to get, address your question. I'm actually kind of thinking in the background in that reg regard. But the idea is that this pure land Buddhism that you may have heard about and even what we just read it sort of is about this idea of other heavenly abodes and and if you just sort of like have an image of Akshobhya, blue-bodied, uh, immovable Buddha, then you could be reborn there when you die. And there's solace in that. And in fact, there's a whole big, you know, chunk of Buddhism in the world that is about hospice so, consoling the dying so that they can go to the pure land. And there's a way that, you have to be really on your upaya game not to be a philosophical jerk and be like, there's no Buddha land. Why do they think they're going? Like, you, you have to really, really appreciate this upaya. And I'm actually um, going to, like, go even deeper. I'm going to double down on the pure land in a moment. I'm going to really, like, you know, try to do this pure land stuff some justice here in a minute. But before that, I just want you to, to know that there is this whole just world of Buddhism where there are these various pure lands that are accessible after you die. And again, the upaya here is about, oh, I would say peace of mind. And that it's like, <laughs> you can be the biggest philosophical jerk you want and poke emptiness holes in people's dreams or their whatever. But the actual solace and comfort that someone might get from that is probably invaluable in that sense. So I'm not suggesting, Noam, that you advocate for like devotional pure land, be reborn in pure land type stuff. I just want you to know that that's one side of it where there's this consolation that you'll go to a pure land, right? Now, if if, you know, who you want to talk to is a heavy Dharma hitter, then that's a different question because then we're talking about the performance, we're talking about the performance goes on, right? And that moment to moment to moment, each moment to the next is the performance. <laughs> and even though there's no self or no, no soul going on underneath of that, there's still, oh, the performance keeps going on. And so... The idea is, is that the performance will continue. The performance will continue. And so you can find consolation in that if you're kind of like a, you know, in, in dis, or not, if you're not into samsara, you're a little like, but I don't want the performance to keep going on or whatever. But the idea is that, well, in terms of consciousness, the ever evolving nature of consciousness, one moment to the next, the performance does keep going on. So that's the heavy Dharma side of it, which is about emptiness. Then there's the more Upaya, uh, Pure Land Buddhism side of it. Now, Noam, I actually think that in terms of 
your question, perhaps, and I don't, you know, I don't know your situation and I, and it's tricky, but I, the real, you know, the, uh, I think that if somebody is already minded in a certain way, talking about pure lands can be beneficial in either form. But there's this deeper dharma, which is the, the message that Shariputra gave to Anatha Pindika. It's the message that Vimalakirti gave to everybody in chapter two. And it's this idea that the attachment and the clinging to life is causing suffering now and all the way to you actually die. And so the lesson is actually about equanimity peace and equanimity now and that'll get you covered for the great passing you'll be set upon the great passing if you get equanimity uh taken care of so my suggestion gnome is teach equanimity thank you michael best i got I have a, a, a few comments that I need to make. They pertain to Eric's comments about tantric empowerment and the Tathagata um, being perceived outside of oneself and all that. Um, and it sort of pertains to the little talk I just did about Pure Land. I, I hope that this grand performance that I've done kind of made this clear but I want to say it so that it's very clear. You might have noticed that in the, now I'm, I'm skipping the first chapter that in which the entire sutra happened, I'm skipping that. You might have recalled that when the thrones came from the other universe, well, there was the other universe and there was our universe, right? And then those thrones came from that other universe to ours. And of course, Vimalakirti has this house of emptiness, which allows this teleportation of these thrones from this other world to come to our world, right? But there was a little bit of like, you know, a crossing over, right? Where the thrones that were in that world came to our world. And in our world, we're so small and we're so subservient to authority that we couldn't imagine being giants sitting on our own sovereign throne, right? Only in Meru Devyajya, Meru Pratiparaja's world, do they get to have such sovereignty, right? Well, we got a little, we got a little bit of their sovereignty in the Saha world, right? So that happened. Then, of course, I want to remind you of the, in that same chapter, the inconceivable liberation where Vimalakirti taught us all how to put a mountain into a mustard seed without shrinking the, the mountain, without growing the mustard seed. Now that was just a, a mountain in, in our Saha world, right? That was just a, a mountain I could go find and then I'll go find a mustard seed in our world and I could put a terrestrial Saha world mountain in a terrestrial Saha world mustard seed. Oh wow, that's crazy, right? So that was like the next step. Then in the Sarvaganda Suganda, right? Suganda Kuta, the, the perfume world, something interesting happened where Vimalakirti created a, a bodhisattva entity here that went to that world and got some food from that world and brought it back for us to eat. And we ate of that food, right? And, it, and all of a sudden our bodies were perfumed with it and all of that, right? So there was this even more intimate colliding of worlds, right? Where we're, we're eating the food of a different world, right? Well, again, what I'm hoping my performance showed you, <laughs> demonstrated, right, was the Malakirti taking this whole other world that is pure pleasure. I didn't mention Abhirati actually doesn't have hell realms. No hell realms. Um, 
it's it's really nice there. The descriptions of it are really, really nice. And it's a unique land where there's these three bejeweled ladders that connect the heavenly realms to the earthly realms. So it's real easy actually to go in between. Well, I don't exactly know the three ladders. There's a lot of commentary on what they mean. For me, when I read it, it seems to be a easy ladder mobility between the realm of desire, the realm of form, and the formless realm. That you don't actually need to meditate in abhirati, just an escalator. Oh, want to go back down to the desire realm to have a milkshake, going up to the emptiness, going back down. Like, real easy, right? So, Vimalakirti took that whole world and brought it to this world and plopped it right down in front of us. In fact, he did this crazy thing where the two interpenetrated and permeated each other seamlessly, right? I don't know about you, but I think I know what they're talking about. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't think they're talking about another realm or another dimension. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I think they're talking about what happened in chapter one, where the Buddha taught Shariputra how to change his attitude and perspective in the world that he lives in. And that's bringing Abhirati, plunking it right down in front of you. How you like me now, right? That's sort of what's going on there. Tacked on to that is this Akshobhya, the immovable one. That's what akshobhya means, the immovable one. So this idea of akshobhya is very, very intimately connected to the idea of ananya, um, imperturbability. Um, I just uh, put up a dharma talk actually on a sutra on the imperturbable, which is equivalent kind of equivalent to upeksha or that equanimity that I was just talking about? Well, you know, again, there's a lot of traditions that are in the world. One tradition is that these Buddha lands are actual other worlds that you can go be reborn in. And I don't claim to not know that or not think that, right? That's totally within every realm of possibility. Along with that idea of these Buddha lands being other places is the idea of these Tathagatas, Akshobhya, Amitabha, Merudivajya, all these other Tathagatas. There is one tradition that they're kind of like beings and that you could go, you know, either pray to them and have a relationship with them or actually be, re be reborn in their worlds and see them type of a thing. And I, I wouldn't necessarily deny that either. But my feeling about a lot of this, especially from a sutra like this, is that this Buddha or this Tathagata Akshobhya, well, you know, immovability, imperturbability, nothing gets to you, right? You just like, totally imperturbable. That's a quality of the Buddha. That's the quality of a Buddha. It's my feeling that this Tathagata kind of represents that quality of Buddhahood, that immovable quality of Buddhahood. And that if you get yourself in an immovable Akshobhya state, you might as well be reborn in Abhirati. You might as well be reborn in the land of Omni pleasure, ambi pleasure, if, you, if you're Akshobhya, right? And now, it, you know, this idea of the, the Buddha that teaches by smells and all of that, same idea, right? That this, the subtlety of, of the Buddha, the subtlety of this Dharma, man, it's like a smell, right? And so I would just suggest that there's a way of thinking of these various Buddhas as being qualities of Buddhahood itself. And then what it would mean, uh, Eric, from a tantric point of view, what would it mean to develop a devotional relationship with immovability? Not with Akshobhya Buddha per se,
but with immovability. <laughs> right. So I'm just kind of throwing you a bunch of like ways of thinking about what happened. But in particular, I really do think that this, um, well, I just, I really do think that this sutra is a performance of the Dharma in a very, you know, like I, I did my best to perform it and it is a performance, but that through that performance, Abhirati comes into the world. And it's the only way it comes into the world <laughs> is through this performance, right? And I would suggest on that note too, that, that the, the language at the end, the, the, the one who reads, recites, copies out, all of that language, it's about the idea that the only place that these things exist, it's, I didn't want to mention this any other night, but I'll mention it tonight. This is the, this is the never ending Dharma. This is like the never ending story, right? Bastion, believe in the Dharma, right? Don't, don't let the Dharma die, right? That's, it's like the never ending story. And what I mean by that is that there's a really deep um, reality to these places that are in these books that when you read them and talk about them, that is their very reality. We went to Abirati. We saw Lakshobia. It happened. So I just wanted to make those few points, right? <laughs> um, I have uh, just two more things real quick it'll just take a second um i do need every i need needed everyone to know that all versions of the Mal vimalakirti sutra they have a effectively a 13th chapter huh 12 mysterious 13th i that formula i've seen that formula before right um but this idea of the last chapter it's a very important part of of dharma of buddhism especially of sutra recitation um it's it's you know it i would really like to transfer any and all merit that's been generated from this i would genuinely like to trans transfer to all sentient beings for the benefit of all sentient beings truly genuinely and that is a that is a must <laughs> um you know that's that's part of how this works is that dedication of any of them, any goodness or merit that came out of this, right? So that is part of this last chapter. It's the dedication of the merit. It's the transferring of the merit and all of that. Um, but it ends in a very funny way. So then, Chakra Indra Devanam. Indra, the god of thunder and lightning, the prince of gods, said to the Buddha, World honored one. Formerly, I've heard from the Tathagata and from Manjushri, the crown, crown prince of the Dharma, many hundreds of thousands of teachings of the Dharma, but I have never before heard a teaching of the Dharma as remarkable as this instruction into the entrance into the method of the inconceivable. All right. At these words, the Buddha said to Chakra, Prince of Gods, excellent, excellent Prince of Gods. The Tathagata rejoices in your good words and praise of this sutra, right? So then the Buddha says, yeah, you're right. This is a really good sutra. In fact, let's suppose, Prince of Gods, that this whole billion-fold world system were as full of Tathagatas as it is covered with groves of sugar cane, rose bushes, and bamboo thickets, with herbs and flowers, right? And let's say a world of Tathagatas of that many, right? That there was a noble person, son or daughter, that honored them all, revered them all respected and adored them all, offering them all sorts of comforts and offerings for an eon, 
for more than an eon. And let's just suppose that all of these Tathagatas enter into their ultimate final liberation and nirvana, and that that son or daughter, right, honors each of the Tathagatas, each of them, by enshrining their preserved bodies in a memorial stupa mound and makes of precious stones, each as large as a world, <laughs> right? rising as high as the world of Brahma. And this person adorned all of those stupas with parasols, banners, standards, and lamps. And let's suppose finally that having erected all of these stupas for all of those Tathagatas, that that person were to devote an eon or even more to offering all of those stupas, flowers and perfumes and banners and standards while playing drums and playing music. All of that being done, what do you think, Chakra, Prince of Gods? Would that noble son or daughter receive much merit as a consequence of all that activity? Chakra, the Prince of Gods, replied, so much merit, world honored one. Many, many merits. Oh, Sugata, were one to spend hundreds of thousands of millions of eons, it would be impossible to measure the, the limit of the mass of merits that that noble son or daughter would thereby gather from all that activity. Well, the Buddha said, Have faith, Prince of Gods, and understand this. Whoever accepts this exposition of the Dharma, called instruction in the inconceivable liberation, who recites it and understands it deeply, he or she will gather merits even greater than those of those who performed all those acts. How could that be? Because, Prince of Gods, the enlightenment of the Buddhas arises from the Dharma. And one who honors them by the and one honors them by the worship of the Dharma, not by the worship of material things or by material worship. Thus it is taught, Prince of Gods, and thus you should understand it. <laughs> okay, so that's a lot of merit. We just uh acute oh we gotta get okay. I'm transferring all the merit that we got just from that. And on that note, I, I do want to say that this, this, the sutra actually goes on and we, we get about a, 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 in a past lives, there was, a, you know, and it just never, it's never ends. It never ends really. But I am going to end it there. Um, that's all I got, folks. But da da da. Uh. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was enlightening. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you, thank you. This has just been an incredible eight weeks. This has been so much fun. Um, thank you, Michael, and thank you, everyone who was here and who asked questions and uh, showed up every week and went on this crazy dharma adventure with us this was so much fun yeah. um, and we have one more night in the series um so on thursday night same uh room michael taft will be leading the last meditation in this series that's based on this part of the sutra that we just read so come back for that on thursday and it is very sad this is over, but we at least have the consolation prize, which is that MC Owens will be back here on Friday um, to talk about uh, visual representations of Buddhas, right? Yep. Yeah. So that will be Friday night um, in the same room. Yeah, at 7.30. And there'll be a talk and there'll be time for a Q&A. So, huh. This is merely the end of this performance <laughs> and <laughs> there will be other ones. Um, and then I want to say a few words about Donna. So um, in the same way that all things have the nature of a magical creation, 
the collective definitely has that nature. It's sort of crazy to ask when or where it was born because it's this ongoing process and it's being co-created all the time um, by resources that are shared amongst the community. So we have this flow of resources where members of the Sangha, if you can freely give of your resources into the Sangha, that enables us to provide the structure that enables the teachers to freely offer the Dharma to whoever want to hear it. So it's this constantly fluxing, flowing community that's created out of the practice of dana. So tonight, if you're able to practice dana, there are some links in the chat. Um, and if not, it doesn't matter. The point is that the Dharma uh, is accessible to everyone, regardless of financial means. So please practice dana if you can. Um, if you can't, come back anyway. And uh, with that, let's, uh, I'd love to just all unmute ourselves and have like a little thank you yeah. waterfall of just how great this has been. So thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you all so much. Beautiful. Thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you, teacher. <laughs> teacher. And uh, like Katie said, folks, I'll be back on a, on a, Friday, it's not is it this Friday? Yes, Friday. Friday. I think so. Yep. I do not know what day it is anymore, but I'm pretty yep. sure it's this Friday. <laughs> but, but that's a special 7.30 Friday visual presentation. But then Sunday nights, Dharma doors continue, folks. And so I just want you to know, I'm still going to be here with the whiteboard. Um, and I think just to let you know, in case you want to... Um, um, well, in case you want to know, there's a world of sutras related to Vimalakirti. Vimalakirti has a daughter. He's, uh, there, there's all kinds of stuff. And so I actually think I'm going to keep the beat going. That's right. This is going to be a heavy fade out on Vimalakirti, right? So uh, stay tuned for that. I haven't picked exactly the sutra I'm going to do, but it's going to have heavy Vimalakirti uh, resonance. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. Cool. Thank you.